Good afternoon and welcome to the 31st Orkney International Science Festival online. This afternoon, it is my pleasure to introduce a talk titled Traders in the Norwest, given by Dr. Maria Pia Casarini, Polar Historian and Vice President of the Polar Educators International. Our guest this afternoon is a Cambridge graduate and former director of the Italian Savati Polar Institute. Her research of, in the North and South Polar regions has taken her on a total of 10 expeditions, eight in the Arctic and two in the Antarctic. Dr. Casarini is a long time supporter of the Science Festival, having delivered her first talk in 1993. Today, she will be speaking on the subject of the Hudson's Bay Company. Founded 351 years ago by a royal charter of Charles II, the company was granted a vast trading monopoly over Northwest Canada, prized for its abundance in the highly sought after Arctic furs. Retelling the story of the Hudson's Bay Company, Dr. Casarini will examine its impact on Arcadians. The company's vessels called in regularly at Stromness for supplies and to recruit labour, providing an economic boost to the Isles. And among the intrepid souls who signed up to work in Canada were Joseph Eispister, Governor William Thomason, and the great Dr. John Ray. Um, welcome, Dr. Casarini. Thank you very much. Um, should you have any questions for um, Dr. Casarini during the presentation, please enter them into the YouTube live chat and we'll come back to them at the end of the talk. So without further delay, uh, here she is. Thank you very much, Alistair. Thank you for the presentation and I'm delighted to be here, uh, sadly virtually, because uh, all the years that I've been invited to lecture at the Orkney Science Festival, one of the great pleasures has always been to meet with the wonderful people that uh, organize the festival and have become really good friends. So let's hope next year we'll be together. And thank you for asking me again to talk about this fascinating subject of the Hudson's Bay Company. If I can have the first slide, please. OK, the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, most of us know what it is, have a general knowledge of what it did and uh, of what has become now. But there are many aspects, some fundamental and some secondary, which have written the history of a huge part of the world and shaped a half a continent and its people into what it is now. Well, the origin is well known to French adventurers from New France who went to King Charles II in 1665 to propose a commercial venture. Next, please. But I like to go a bit more in depth in the origins of the Hudson Bay Company. Um, this is a, we have to go back to 1534, when the French navigator and explorer Jacques Cartier, next, entered, next please, entered the Gulf of St. Lawrence and uh, took possession of New France for King Francis I and later founded a colony near what is now Quebec. The colony failed, but out of this exploration, the French fur trade with the Native Americans on the Gulf and the river regions began. Next. Uh, Samuel de Champlain sailed into the St. Lawrence in 1603. Next. And in 1608, he began the settlement that was named Quebec on a site uh, near the St. Lawrence River estuary. The fort attracted few residents, and in 1627, Cardinal Richelieu founding, founded the Company of New France, Compagnie de la Nouvelle France, better known as the Compagnie de Saint Associés, the Company of the Hundred Associates. This company was granted the colony of New France, and for 15 years, starting in 1629, was to have the complete monopoly of the fur trade. But war with England began and the company never recovered, although it controlled the new France until 1663. 
This is the background from which the Hudson's Bay Company was born. Next. In the autumn of 1665, two French coureurs de bois sailed into London to find a city in the grip of the worst plague. They went to Oxford, where the court had moved to avoid the plague, and told the royal entourage of a continent with promises of vast riches. Next. They had audience with King Charles II on October 25th. He had ascended the throne in 1660 after the Cromwell years of Puritan repression. The king needed a lot of money to finance his lavish lifestyle and expansion of trade and commerce became national concerns. The English knew that quality furs were part of the French commerce from New France as they had confiscated warehouses of fine furs during the war of 1628-29. The two men from New France, next, were Megar Chouard de Groseillet, uh, 1618 to 1696, and the one in blue on the right, Pierre Esprit Radisson, uh, who was born 20 years later. They were brothers-in-law, originally from France. They knew the land, they had important relations with the native Indian tribes of the Huron, Montagnier, and Algonquin, who provided the furs and helped to fight enemy tribes, mainly the Iroquois. They spoke many local languages and were familiar with the ceremony and diplomacy to be used when dealing with the native tribes. Next. In 1659, they had traveled for over a year as far west as the upper Missouri, trading metal goods with the natives in exchange for excellent furs and had returned to the St. Lawrence in August 1660. The governor of New France, however, had confiscated most of their furs and returned to France. And this guaranteed that the loyalties of the two Frenchmen went elsewhere. And though they went to Boston, they spoke with the British Sir George Cartwright, who, seeing a good thing, uh, accompanied them to London. Next. The proposal to King Charles II was to bypass the St. Lawrence River area, which was further south, and go north to the Hudson Bay, a land where the best beaver pelts could be found in the land of the Cree Indians. This suggestion also revived an English dream never abandoned, which was the search for the Northwest Passage, which had already been attempted from Hudson Bay by the next slide, please, Henry Hudson in uh, 1610 and Thomas Button in 1612 and Thomas James and Luke Fox in 1631. Uh, these attempts had never found any exit out of uh, Hudson Bay. Next, so Prince Rupert of the Rhine, a cousin of the king, was at court in Oxford and listened attentively. He was interested in science and technology and was a founding member of the Royal Society. He put together a group of investors and persuaded the king to give them two small ships. The expedition was delayed, however, by the Fire of London of 1666 and the Second Anglo-Dutch War of 1665 to 67. Finally, set sail in June 1668 with two ships, the Nonsuch and the Eaglet. Uh, the little one, the Nonsuch, was the only one to reach. Uh, Hudson Bay. Uh, the other one had to go back because they had problems. It was only 55 tons, only 54 feet long, 16 meters, and it still reached the Hudson Strait and went south into James Bay, which is a bay south of Hudson Bay, where they located Gold Harbor at the mouth of the river. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, which they named Rupert River. You can see it right at the bottom right uh, Rupert House. That's where they started working from uh, there to, for the first approach. Um, a commercial depot called Charles Fort was uh, what was then named Rupert House was built at the bottom of the bay. When in the spring the local Cree returned to the coast, they learned that the visitors wanted to trade. In the end, over 300 Cree 
Indians came to the fort, but uh, and not such returned to London in October 69, almost four years after Radisson and the Grosselier had first arrived there. It had been worth the wait. The value of no such's cargo and the influence of the men who had backed her led directly to the granting of the Royal Charter the following year. Next, please. Here we see this beautiful manuscript. The charter was granted on May the 2nd, 1670 to Prince Rupert and 17 fellow courtier adventurers. The territory was named Rupert's Land. It was a huge monopoly given an absolute mercantile authority in British law over a territory of some 1.5 million square miles or 4 million square kilometers, an area that hadn't even been explored and was actually the land of the First Nations. The official name was the Company of Adventurers of England Trading into Hudson's Bay, and its first governor was Prince Rupert himself, assisted by a committee of seven wealthy backers. The essential reason for a charter was to protect the investors against competition from their own country and in practice created a monopoly. The initial investors were the most important, wealthy, titled members of London's elite, including even the king's brother, James, Duke of York. Next. It was understood that the company also had political value in expanding geographical knowledge that would lead to the discovery of the Northwest Passage. However, no settlement or missionary zeal was part of the enterprise, and they had to defend the monopoly themselves. No military help from anywhere. They were not to make war on other European nations, namely France, but no diplomatic guidelines were given about how to interact with the natives. You can see that the coat of arms of the Hudson's Bay Company had a very clear command, pro pelle cutem, um, as you're, to acquire a skin, you can risk your own life. That was uh, quite a, a name for a, and a program for the new company. Um, next. The initial model, business model, was quite simple. Um, ships would reach Hudson's Bay each year, laden with goods to trade, and this is a, a conservative list of the goods that uh, the ships were carrying to trade with the Indians. And, uh, and, they, and the ship then would return to England before the waters froze. So they were only spending about two months at the most in, in the area. A number of forts were going to be built along the shores of the bay at the mouth of rivers so that the natives could just come down with their canoes down each river and feed the ship with their furs and bring their pelts. Uh, this plan fitted perfectly with the native traditional habits, by the way, as they spent the winter months in the interior hunting the beavers when the pelts were thickest, and in spring and summer went to the coast. Later on, a fort would be called a factory when an agent or factor would be in charge and spend the winter there in order to expand the contact with the native people. However, the world of relations with the natives was totally unfamiliar to the adventurers, and it took them decades to understand how to foster long-term relationships. At the beginning, with the help and knowledge of the Grosellier and Radisson, everything went well. Next. What is interesting to consider is that all these complicated commercial operations were depending on fashion. The fur obtained in the new territory were not used for warmth or for keeping waterproof, but to turn them into felt in order to make hats. A felt hat would change in fashion with each season, and it became an indispensable accessory to indicate the level of prestige, rank, and wealth. Each had needed the fur of four beaver pelts, and it was so expensive that hats became like heirlooms. Felt was made using heat, moisture, pressure, and also a chemical, mercury nitrate, to shrink the fur fibers so that they would mat together. Hatters worked in small, poorly ventilated laboratories, and soon they ended up being poisoned with symptoms like delirium, 
tremors, depression, memory loss, and hallucinations. It was what became known as the Mad Hatter disease. But the pay was good and the risks were not fully understood. And by a twist of history, at the beginning of the 18th century, London became also a center for the manufacturing of felt hats. In fact, by the 1680s, religious persecutions in France forced the Protestant Huguenots to leave and they moved to England in great numbers. Their main trade was felt and hat making. And soon the best felt hats in Europe were made in England. Next. In the New World, Castor Canadensis was the largest of the beavers, weighing sometimes up to 100 pounds. It was estimated that in the region of Hudson's Bay, there were between 10 and 20 million beavers. The natives wore beaver pelts inside out in the winter to keep warm. And by doing so, they got rid of the soft fur, leaving the coarse outer hair, which was used to make fur coats. A beaver coat previously worn was more valuable than a pelt just taken from a dead beaver. It was called made beaver, and it became the standard unit for barter conversion. What improved the hunting and hence the profit was the use of the steel trap in the company's territories, uh, while before each beaver was clubbed to death, which was a lengthy process. Next. The ambitious business plan employed for the late 1670s consisted in building forts and factories at outposts at the rivers which drained into Hudson's Bay. A uh, moose factory was established in 1672, Fort Albany in 1679, Fort Severn in 1689, and York Factory um, in 1664. Um, then Fort Churchill, that was also called Prince of Wales Fort, was a bit later in 1717. The profits were good in those early years, but the company reinvested the profits to finance expansion. We must remember that the backers were actually wealthy people from the nobility, so they didn't really need a lot of uh, returns straight away. In 1684, 15 years from the beginning, the first dividends were given to shareholders, a very good return of 50%. Dividends between 25 and 50% were paid every year until 1690. Next. Uh, the competition was not agreeable, however, to the French further south. The Groseillers and Radisson were lured back to New France by a large amount of money. The Groseillier went back to his home because he was much older, but uh, the younger Radisson, that we see here, was attracted by a Montreal financier, Charles Aubert de la Chesnay, to join a new venture, the Compagnie du Nord. Next. Uh, the following decade, decades of attacks and destruction uh, was caused by the French Compagnie du Nord, which was carried out with superior forces. We must remember that the Hudson's Bay Company had no military power to defend themselves. In fact, York, York Factory was lost to the French and was renamed Fort Bourbon. Next. And in 1709, all the, all the various uh, the various places that were built had actually gone to the French and Fort Albany, which is uh, on the right, left hand side, just to the north, uh, was the only one left. After the War of Spanish success, Succession under the Treaty of Utrecht of 1713, in 1714, France returned the company property in Hudson Bay. And with the peace in Europe, trade in Hudson Bay returned to a predictable pattern. The business model was sound and the good quality of goods brought from England assured the proper trade. In fact, not only the Cree, but also the Ojibwe from the south and the Chippewyan from the north were attracted in the company's orbit. And it was the Chippewyan that opened the far north to the Hudson's Bay Company, although they feared the Inuit who were their sworn enemies. Next. Uh, in 1717, as I said, the company established Fort Churchill, a Prince of Wales fort, in, which at the time was its northernmost 
post. During the rest of the century, the company's operations were routine, giving dividends between 8 and 12%. And during the time, the Hudson Bay Company kept a model that was actually throughout, valid throughout. They employed only between 200 and 300 people, uh, mostly staying year-round in the trading outposts. These places were poorly maintained and very, very cold. In each fort, there was a chief factor, a second in command, and a number of other officers. Others were the sloop master, a surgeon, some clerks. All the others were laborers, which included skilled tradesmen, a blacksmith, a shipwright, a tailor, a cooper, and a mason. Even in winter, they had to work outside, and the summer was almost as bad on account of the mosquito bites. August was a good time as the ship ships arrived from England, one each at your factory and the Prince of Wales fort, while a third sailed south to resupply Moon's factory in Fort Albany. Unloading the goods had to be done quickly so that the ships could return to England before the ice started forming. A careful inventory of all the goods had to be done, and the company signed the men from three, for three to five years, increasing their salaries significantly if they stayed on for a further three to five years. However, the salaries were always kept low. The indigenous hunter were engaged, hunters were engaged in supplying fresh meat, caribou, deer, wild geese, ptarmigan, and arctic char. The company men also contributed some hunting. All this food was salted, dried, or frozen. They even planted seeds sent from England for vegetables, which had to grow only in the 60 days of the northern summer. Livestock of hardy varieties from Shetland, sheep, goats, cattle, pigs, and horses were also sent from London, and they fared reasonably well. The company kept an almost military structure for daily life, with the officers living in separate quarters from the laborers. Keeping the morale high in the long winter months was paramount, with cards, games, musical instruments, and books. The availability of spirits and excessive alcohol consumption was a problem, especially among the Cree and the Ojibwa, who lived near the forts. It was feared that if denied alcohol, the natives would take their furs to the French, even if their posts were much farther away. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, human nature being what it is, relationships flourished between the company men and the indigenous women. Of unofficial marriages called country marriages became common and families were formed to the mutual advantage of all concerned. This went on for generations. The large number of children born from these unions were called the country born or citizens of the Bay. These children of mixed heritage were brought up around the posts and by 1806 were being taught reading, writing and arithmetic accounts and often found jobs with the company. Uh, some of these unions would end when the employees returned to Europe and the native woman would return to her community. But many traders chose to remain with their families in the vicinities of the trading posts after their work with the Hudson Bay Company finished and never returned to Europe. Can I have the next one, please? The best recruits, here we are, from the lower Scotland and the Orkney Islands, where life was harsh and work was scant. Working distant, isolated Hudson Bay was more promising and profitable than remaining at home. By 1730, most of the workforce came from these two places, and seven years' contracts were encouraged. From the beginning, the men of Orkney played critical roles in the company. Ships arrived every year in Stromness, Orkney, with goods from England to take on additional supplies, hire new works on five-year contracts, and pick up news and parcels for, from the families of existing workers in the new world. Orcadians understood the short winter days and long winter nights, and if the climate was harsh, Orkney men were used to it. If the work was tough, they were used to it as well. Soon, they accounted for 80% of all the workers of the Hudson's Bay Company. 
1799, of the 530 men working in the Hudson's Bay Company posts in North America, um, 416 were from Orkney. Next. Some of these Orcadians rose through the ranks, as Ali Bert said before. Joseph Isbister um, was an Orcadian who rose through these ranks. In 1735, he was appointed mate of the Beaver, one of the ships, a sloop. Uh, he was the first Orkney man to become a governor at Fort Albany in 1752. But his rigid attitude towards indigenous women caused an attack and the destruction of the fort. Apparently, he had decreed that uh, men at the post should not have uh, any relationship with native women but himself. So that didn't go down very well. Next. The story of William Thompson is uh, a varied and very, very interesting. He was from South, South Ronaldsey and was uneducated when he signed on as a laborer with the Hudson Bay Company in 1760. He spent seven years at York, York Factory and Seven House, where he received a serviceable education. He rose to become a chief at York Factory and kept uh, excellent relationships with the Indians around Lake Winnipeg and Lake Manitoba. Unfortunately, he was accused of negligence in containing uh, an outbreak of smallpox in the area. And um, as in the next slide, after a long time with the company in which he was demoted, he returned to live in St. Ronald's in Dundas House. Next. He left all his assets to support the establishment of a free school for the poor called Thomason, Thomason's Academy, which is at just opposite his house. Uh, in another account of, um, so this was a free school for the poor, uh, but in another account that I read, it is said that Thomason's Academy was meant for the children of the Bay. I, that is the children of mixed heritage from the Hudson's Bay Company fort. So it would be interesting to see which was the actual fact. It seems to me that probably it was un, possibly unlikely that children of mixed heritage would be taken back to Orkney to receive an education. Anyway, prices of furs varied depending on the location and the distance. The trade was some kind of established alliance causing little friction and good returns. However, trading with Europe changed the entire native population, which moved according to the establishment of new trading posts in the region. Epidemics were a constant problem and sometimes caused starvation. Next slide, please. During the second half of the 18th century, a desire for exploration started again. Christopher Middleton was an employer of the Hudson's Bay Company and uh, had made 16 annual voyages. In 1741, the Royal Navy sent him to search for a northwest passage from Hudson's Bay. He discovered Wager Bay and Repulse Bay, which is close by, both dead ends. And in 1745, the British government offered a £20,000 reward for the discovery of an Northwest Passage from Hudson Bay. Next. Samuel Hearn was sent by the Hudson's Bay Company to explore the land towards the west, hoping to find a route to the Pacific. Next. Instead, he found a river which drained north, the copper mine, and he was the first European to see the Arctic Ocean. Next. On his way back after this expedition, he founded Fort Cumberland in the interior uh, in 1774. And later on, he was made chief factor of Prince of Wales Fort in January 1776. In 1778, France declared war against Britain and French Comte de la Perouse attacked the company's forts yet again. Next. In 1779, the traders from Montreal officially became organized into an enterprise called the Northwest Company, and they were called the Norwesters. 
Each of the two companies had advantages and disadvantages. The Hudson's Bay Company could get its goods more easily in the interior because of Hudson Bay, but it had a shortage of young men on account of the American War of Independence, 1775 to 83, the French Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, as we said, the Hudson Bay Company only had 500 people on their books and didn't want to promote the mixed race, but want, preferred to have them in the field, hunting furs. The Northwest people were aggressive instead, made enormous profits and moved west as whole areas became beavered out. Um, they used uh, brandy and rum in large quantities for trade, uh, which was something that the Hudson Bay Company, was, which were against this practice, had to follow in order to keep the supply of furs. As you can imagine, there was deep rivalry between the two companies. Next. One of the partners of the North First Company was a young Scotsman from the Hebrides, Alexander Mackenzie, who in 1789 left on a voyage of land exploration to the West. Again, the North First Passage was elusive, and the river that he followed turned north and reached the Arctic Ocean, just like the copper mine. It was named after him, and that's the Mackenzie River. Next. For the Northwest Company, transport of goods was complicated. From Montreal to Grand Portage on Lake Superior, it was a journey by birch bark canoes manned by voyageurs of mixed race that took 40 days and 35 portages, covering 1,600 kilometers. At each portage, where the waterway became impassable, the goods in each canoe had to be taken out, transported overland together with the canoes themselves, and then had to be reloaded at the next viable waterway. It was a lengthy and backbreaking process. Smaller canoes instead started from the west and met at Grand Portage. And that was uh, the yearly gathering to get all the furs from the interior. Next. The Hudson's Bay Company was at a disadvantage with this kind of transport because there were no birch trees near Hudson Bay. But Orkney again came to the rescue. Orcadian boats were flat bottomed and could be dragged over logs on pre cut roads, making port portages easier. These York boats were manufactured at Moose Factory and York Factory, hence the name. And while the um, the, bar, the birch bark uh, canoes of the, camp, of the other company required at least 12 men. For the York boat, a crew of six men could power a cargo of up to 6,000 pounds. Through these years, rivalry continued between the companies and the violence and the attacks were getting too much for all concerned. So the British government stepped in considering that a merger of the two companies was the only solution. In the summer of 1821, all the senior officers of both companies were called at York factory. Natives and voyageurs joined them. Next, in charge of the proceedings was a young newcomer, George Simpson from Dingwall, Scotland, and he was the acting governor in chief of Rupert's land. The British colonial office wanted a stable situation in Canada at the time to counteract the American expansion to the West. The newly formed fur trading monopoly retained the name Hudson's Bay Company, but the operations were a mixture of both styles, custom and structures. There were too many overlapping forts because at the time of competition, forts were built from both companies at the same place. There were 97 of the Northwest Company and 76 forts belonging to the Hudson's Bay Company. And many were in fact in direct competition. 2000 employees, as the sum total became, were to be reduced in five years to just over 700. Next. The problem of long-term employees who didn't want to return to Europe was solved by the existence of uh, the Red River Settlement, the utopistic dream of Thomas Douglas, 5th Earl of Selkirk, which started in 1812 as an idyllic rural settlement, but in reality was not so. 
It was attacked in 1817 by the Northwest Company, but later on was still a viable as a settlement. And by the way, the Red River settlement is where the present day Winnipeg is. Uh, the merged domain of the two companies was enormous. It was 3 million square miles, 7.8 million square kilometers, as large as Western Europe. And the Hudson's Bay Company became a global concern for most of the world's firms, and very profitable too. Dividends were never below 10% and 20% by 1828. Next. George Simpson Power grew in parallel. Knighted in 1841, he became virtually a dictator, micromanaging every aspect of the employer's lives, always intent on saving money and increased profits. He traveled constantly by canoe to visit the farthest forts. He was called the Little Emperor for his autocratic manner in running the Hudson's Bay Company. And in 1828, he established the company's headquarters as Lachine near Montreal. After the merger, the work of the Hudson's Bay Company continued in Orkney, always the last port of call before crossing the Atlantic, and still the main employer of young men from Orkney and Shetland, although diminished as the new mixed heritage communities filled some of the positions. Next. A website of the Hudson's Bay Company archives, now in Winnipeg, Manitoba, gave some insight on the provenance of the Hudson's Bay Company workforce. I have analyzed a list of nearly 10,000 Hudson's Bay Company uh, records of servants, servant contracts, employed by the company from 1780 to 1926. And the number of Arcadians that I counted is 3060. Next. Um, I was actually curious about uh, how the, the Ray family was considered. So Ray, the second one down, uh, we only have three Rays uh, in this um, connection. And strangely enough, there's no John Ray. So that makes me suspect that uh, the list is somewhat incomplete. Um, for a Polish historian, the 19th century is inextricably linked to the renewed interest in the search for a Northwest Passage and the subsequent uh, Franklin searches. The Hudson's Bay Company was involved in different ways. Next, by providing assistance uh, to expeditions such as the two land expeditions of Sir John Franklin in 1821-23, and 1826-28, and next, to the first search expedition of Sir John Richardson in 1848-49. Um, these uh, were a bit disruptive for the company, but because uh, the, um, it was the Admiralty requesting help of the company, which was really semi-official uh, semi part of uh, the establishment had to comply. Um, the company also increased the, the geographical knowledge of its territory through the expedition of uh, their employees, Peter Warren Dees and Thomas Simpson, 1937-39, from the mouth of the Mackenzie to Point Barrow in the Arctic. Next, the most famous uh, Hudson's Bay Company man and Orkney man is certainly Dr. John Ray, who became a company man almost by chance. He only meant to be a surgeon for a season in 1833, aged 20. But the returning Hudson's Bay Company ship was caught in the ice and he had to spend the winter at Moose Factory next. And he remained there for 10 years and he, his travels became legendary. He single-handedly traced most of the northern coast of North American continent. Next. We can see here all the, the travels that uh, the exploration of John Ray, which really helped to define the borders and the boundaries of the North American continent. Next, he also used uh, native snowshoes Next, but also the latest technology such as the rubber halted boat, which can be seen even now in the lovely Stromness Museum. Next, and here he is depicted going native. Uh, next, 
while John Ray was on a geographical expedition for the Hudson Bay Company, not a Franklin search expedition, he met by chance a group of Eskimos who revealed to him the fate of the Franklin expedition and the place where it had perished. This brought him in direct conflict with the London establishment of the Admiralty, Charles Dickens, and the indomitable Lady Franklin, when his report, based on the Eskimo information, hinted at cannibalism having taken place. Uh, as a result, John Ray was never knighted. Next. Uh, the century flowed without traumas for the company until 1859, when the company's license came up for renewal. It was important for Britain that the expansion of the United States should be thwarted. In 1869, the Hudson Bay Company surrendered its land rights to the British Crown, which then transferred to the Dominion of Canada. The company received £300,000 in compensation and retained all the forts and factories and surrounded lands. It must be said that the company had been offered by the Americans something like a million pounds, but uh, that wasn't allowed. Um, in the 20th century, the name of the Hudson's Bay Company was linked to large department stores in cities which had been company posts, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary, next. Um, the flagship uh, shop is in Toronto. This is uh, in the 2009, it still had the, the bay, the yellow logo. But uh, that was changed next uh, in 2013. This is also in Toronto, and um, which is called now Hudson Bay. Like this uh, next, uh, what remained timeless in the record of the Hudson Bay Company is the iconic points blanket, which has been in production for over 200 years. Uh, with this, uh, I finish simply reminding and noticing that the traders in the Northwest certainly shaped a continent and its people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Casarini. Um, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I've, I've learned so much and I'm sure the viewers at home have also learned an awful lot. Uh, the YouTube chat has been uh, quite busy. Right. Um, so uh, if you don't mind, we'll go Absolutely. through a few of the questions from that. Yeah. Um, the, first, the first question is, did any country have a protocol for dealing with the First Nation peoples? Absolutely not. That was uh, the problem. I mean, um, native people in the mind of Europeans were just, uh, I, I wouldn't like to say, but almost like beavers, you know, they were serviceable. There was no uh, intention whatsoever at the beginning anyway but France seems to through its people not through any official protocol was just uh, any relationship was based on the individual and in fact that's why the Frenchmen were very useful at the beginning for the Hudson's Bay Company because they had become familiar with the rituals and the, the way to deal with the natives and understanding their ways in which they would trade. In the end, they all wanted trade, but uh, you know, I don't think there was any respect for the actual people unless it was some personal, Person. some person doing it, but certainly not as company policy. Yeah, so the personal relationships rather than yeah. systems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Swain asks, uh, did the goods that were traded um, for furs change over time? And if so, how? Well, um, as far as I know, the, the, individ the Indians or the, the Eskimos, let's use the old name because, you know, for historians, it's very difficult to call the Eskimos Inuit because that is really a modern term. Uh, but anyway, it probably changed slightly, but uh, it, it wasn't really all that different uh, in the way that, uh, of course, they would acquire more things, but generally speaking, they were still living in the land and procuring furs. So, you know, the trap, uh, you know, the leg trap for the beaver was obviously an improvement instead of clubbing the, on the head. But generally speaking, as far as I know, there wasn't a huge difference. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, Flying Collie asks, um, uh, apart from furs, did the locals offer any other goods? Um, and she, she notes that some of the goods traded weren't that good for um, people's health. Um, from what I, from the material that I have analysed, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company was interested in furs. But the one thing that, in fact, caused even a war in about 12, uh, 1813 was pemmican. Pemmican was a staple food that the Indians had devised by killing the caribous uh, when the time came and then mixing with um, fruit from uh, whatever bark trees that they found and then uh, mixing it together and it kept it was high calorie it was very easy to carry very concentrated calories so this was uh, um, a very important staple diet but mostly for the voyageur of the northwest company because remember the northwest company was trading much much further east so they had much longer travel time from the beaver country to the place where the, the goods would be shipped to Europe. So they needed a lot of uh, high calorie food. So in fact, uh, it would be interesting, uh, I had prepared something, but there's no time, to consider what uh, exchange in food happened, apart from alcohol, which unfortunately was, uh, yeah. as, you, as you heard, a serious issue with every, everybody trading with the natives. And it still is. I mean, if we look at the Inuit now in, uh, in the outpost in the Arctic, it's still a huge problem. But the interesting thing was that pemmican, which was definitely a native invention, very practical, actually filtered through to the point that the Royal Navy used it for all the expeditions to the South Pole uh, in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, Captain Scott always had pemmican, which they could uh, just melt in boiling water and would make hoosh and a nice soup, a nice warm, very high calorie. Whilst uh, the new world, uh, the old world, that is to say, once they started trading flour, for instance, brought what the natives then turned into bannock, which is also a staple diet now for people who live in, in Canada and the Arctic. Uh, just have time for a couple of more questions. Um, have the experiences of country brides and children of the Bay been fully explained by historians? And what, are there gaps in what we know or deficiencies in how we think about this? I must say, I don't know much about it because it's never been part of my research. I'm more for the Northwest Passage and other things. Um, I suspect that there wasn't a lot of written records because, uh, okay, you can get written records if the men decided to stay with their families. And, uh, you know, and they went and they settled in Canada or uh, in North America anyway. But uh, when the native bride went back with her mixed children with their tribe, there would be no record of that. There's one instance, in fact, in Orkney happened that uh, I can't remember the name, but um, an employee of the Hudson Bay Company, his uh, native bride, the wife died, and he brought back to Orkney three mixed children that lived actually in Orkney. Okay, we, we had a comment uh, on YouTube uh, from Patricia Long that it could be to do with this. Um, but she says that uh, Alexander Kennedy mm -hmm. um, from Brayhead and St Margaret's Hope uh, came back to Orkney three times to bring sons home to school. Uh -uh. And he had become one of the chief... Uh, factors of Hudson's Bay Company. Um, uh -huh. I don't. I don't know if that's anything to do with it. We did mention the uh, South Ronaldsea School 
Exactly. Um, well, that's so, excellent. Thank you for the information. That sounds uh, <laughs> that sounds like I, it did happen then. Yeah, I, I can't elaborate on that, but uh, that's what I've been relying on. Thank you for, <laughs> for letting me know. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Okay. Uh, so I think we'll uh, wrap that up there. Um, thank you to Dr. Casarini and thank our you. audience at home. I'd also like to thank the technical team. All this year's events are free, but if you'd like to support the Science Festival, you can donate and instructions on how to do this are found on the website, which is oisf.org. Um, please do subscribe to the Orkney Science Festival YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. And remember that you can join us at the Festival Club this evening from 9.30pm uh, to chat with all the day's speakers um, in an informal setting and the link to join can be found on the festival website so thank you once again and goodbye thank you bye